Good morning, everyone. Just letting the stream get started, get loaded, and we will go here in about 30 seconds. And so that means if you are watching the replay, and I haven't had a chance to edit it yet, you get to see me. So good morning, or good evening, good afternoon, whenever you're watching this. Thank you for tuning in. All right, with that, let's get things going. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of The Mandate. I'll be your host, Adam Hoffman, here today. I am very grateful and excited that you are able to join us. If you're watching live on this Friday morning here in Austin, Texas, it is uh, frigid but sunny, so we will take it. Uh, today, I've got a really amazing guest. Ed and I had a chance to connect uh, about a month ago, thanks to a mutual friend of ours. But we are here today to talk about masculinity in the workplace uh, and really the difference between this constrained form of masculinity that we've all been living for so long and this new and beautifully defined definition of liberating masculinity uh, that Ed and his co-author come up with. So today I'm joined by Ed Fraunheim, who is the co-author of Reinventing Masculinity. Um, with another amazing ad that hopefully we'll have on the show at some point in time. And it is called Reinventing Masculinity, The Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. Uh, ed has been a journalist, a speaker and consultant, and he studied the workplace, technology, and culture matters for more than 25 years. So thanks for hanging out with me this morning, Ed. Thanks, Adam. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. How are you? I am good. I uh, like most of the country or the world a little it's been a kind of a, a topsy-turvy couple of days uh but i'm seeing uh, silver linings in in our national uh, government and in society and uh excited about a new a new start to the year uh, i we've been talking about i've got a new chapter in my work life where i've left uh, the company that i was at for seven years great place to work which is a great place so i'm excited about new year new you in a lot of different ways uh, so thanks thanks for asking yeah absolutely i I think congratulations on this next step of the journey. Um, I feel like when we've talked, you've uh, you you did so much great work at a great place to work. Which every time I get to say that, like I you know, <laughs> you, you, you know couldn't have picked a better name for an organization. Um, and I hadn't fully realized just how much you know I had looked at the research and the studies and all the data that um, that you guys had created as part of that organization. Um, it's been really. I don't know, instrumental to the way that, that I think about organizations. And a lot of times when I've looked at places to go and work, you know, I've, I've, I think many of us have probably seen a lot of the information and research that you guys have done. Well, I'm glad that it's been helpful. I, I agree. It, we, there's been really good content and research that's come out of there and really made the connection between a high trust, inclusive workplace and great results and, and how important that is for people to thrive uh, and, and really bring out, uh, be their best selves at work and then, it, and then in society as well. So we talk about great places to work being better for people, better for business and better for the world. And uh, I know that that, that is going to continue, uh, of course, without me, uh, but um, uh, I'm excited to kind of, you know, push forward in some new directions as well. Cool. Well, we hopefully we'll get to a couple of those new directions as we journey today um, through our conversation, but let, let's jump in. Before we get to work, I'd love to hear what has your journey been like with masculinity? It's been a, uh, int an interesting one, I would say. Uh, not always an easy one. Um, I, I think about that kind of critical period for a lot of men and boys around the 12, 13, 14, coming into adolescence and early, early manhood. And uh, that was a time where I started, you know, I think being aware of, of these rules and expectations. Uh, to be a strong man, to be uh, a winner, um, to be kind of stoic. Uh, and, and those didn't work out. They didn't fit so well for me. I, I tended to be, uh, I wasn't, I was skinny, wasn't that super strong guy. Uh, I, I froze up in some key moments in sports, even though I played a lot of sports, like I, I wasn't, didn't have that kind of winner feel. Um, and uh, I was, I'm, I'm a sensitive guy. I was a sensitive guy then, still am. And that sort of uh, went, ran counter to how you're supposed to show up. Uh, and then if we move to the chapter of being, you know, an adult in the workplace, some similar stuff was, was, was challenging around those traditional expectations. You're supposed to rise to the top of the corporate heap, you know, and, and I've had this strange journey where I, I've, I feel like uh, I'm proud of what I've accomplished in my work life, but I haven't 
re risen to the to the uh, top echelons of the hierarchies. Uh, in particular, I've managed one person for one day. I may have the shortest, the smallest management career in the history of the uh, of the world, maybe. Um, and uh, so it, that has been something that at times has plagued me. And so it's taken me a while to realize those those expectations of how we can show up as a man really didn't serve me. And I, uh, I think I'm trying to, in this work with this book, kind of turn my own lemons into lemonade uh, to, to see that, you know what, actually there's, there's a deeper sense of satisfaction that comes from not being about self uh, aggrandizement and, and achievement alone, but actually service and purpose. Uh, and that actually emotions are valuable and it's, it's actually not so great to always be competing and to, to collaborate, not worry about winning. So uh, my my own journey is reflected in this work, and uh, appreciate you asking about it. I'm hoping that uh, helping out, help other guys that may have had some struggles along those that I've had. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the that's the impetus for this show in the first place, and my, it's been interesting because I've heard similar stories from the full spectrum, if you will, of masculinity from what externally might look like very. I don't even like to, to, to use these terms, to be totally honest, but just to paint the picture of, you know, somebody who might be, you know, the, sk the skinny guy and more sensitive and more feminine on, on one end of the spectrum over to the other, like hyper-masculine, super muscular, like tough, comes off as aggressive. And everybody in between, there's this feeling of like, it still doesn't feel right. I, there's, mm -hmm. there's something else out there. Um, no matter, no matter where you're at. And, and that's one of the reasons why I was so, when I read the term for the first time, constrained masculinity, um, I was like, yeah, that's what it, that's what it feels like. And I've heard people talk about, you know, oh, masculinity puts us in this box and, you know, we don't realize that we're in the box, but we're always trying to get out of it because there's all, this whole other world that we either yeah. can see and want access to, or we've had access to, but we feel guilt and shame, or in some case, punishment from it. So, like, how how did you get to these two definitions? Well, first of all, thanks for exposing those challenges for guys, and and how limited what we call we use the term very similar to what you said, confined masculinity. Uh, how that is it, it kind of sh prevents men from living a full human life, really. Uh, and the way we got to that term. Uh, is, you know, I owe a lot to my co-author, Ed Adams, for, for looking into the psychology work of um, uh, a Japanese psychologist named Morita. And his, he had a, a notion of a confined self. And in a confined self tended to be a pretty unhealthy version of the self. It was self-absorbed. Um, it, was, it was not in community with others. Uh, and, and there were like a lot of problems that, that came out of that. And we kind of applied that lens to see, you know, this actually helps understand the ways we've been taught to be men, that we have limited roles we're allowed to play and limited ways we're allowed to relate to each other. Uh, that's kind of how we can boil it down though. We're supposed to be the protector, the provider, maybe the conqueror, you know, but not necessarily the caregiver, not necessarily the environmental steward or the sensitive lover. Uh, and then in the relation piece, we're mostly supposed to fight. You know, we're supposed to be in rivalry uh, and, and win all the time as opposed to collaborate. Uh, and we're not supposed to be emotionally attuned to other people so much as be reserved uh, and, and focus on just the rational. So, uh, you know, one last piece of that is that we're actually supposed to be self-made and, and, and islands to ourselves. And that actually ignores all the ways and the beauty of community and connection uh, that we know human, human, human nature is really made, on, made out of that. So that's kind of the... Uh, you know, a somewhat short answer to, to how we came to that term, uh, confined masculinity. Yeah, it's, it's really helpful. And I, all those words, I felt you, you couldn't have picked better words. I, I apologize for. Don't uh, worry. We, we use that, we use that word. Term. It's, a good, the book. <laughs> it's a good but, synonym. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and maybe that's, it's just my, um, I, I, I'm putting my own spin on it because that's that's what it's felt for me as I just I felt so constrained with this definition of, of what it is. And it's helped me think about all the parts of my life where I felt not not enough. And that's kind of been a theme for me recently is less thinking about um, I need more, more, more. But like, what what is my definition of enough of these things? And certainly the one that I've felt like I have struggled to have enough of in my life is connection. And that's been a piece that 
has come up with time and time again with the men that I've talked to. And I think humans in general, especially right now. And then the, the other one is that my expression of compassion is like, you know, that's something that I think is viewed as uh, feminine or weak or things like that. But like, it's just so, such a core part of who I am and how I am. And I felt like I've never really fully been able to uh, express that. I know those are two, two big parts um, that you, you talk about in the book. So before we get into the workplace, let's, uh, let's talk about the other side. So you've got confined masculinity, which is kind of what we've all been living in today and liberating masculinity, which is, you know, the exciting part that, that you guys talk about. What, what is that? What goes into it? Tell us more about it. Sure. We see liberating masculinity as a way to be a man that really frees you to live a full life. Uh, it, it's allowing you to break out of those confined strictures when it comes to roles, relationships, uh, and, and uh, really even about the soul and the spirit. Um, so some of the things that are, that are critical there are, as you, as you pointed out, the connection and compassion piece. Now we're saying we're going to be compassionate. We're going to be emotionally uh, intelligent and attuned to our feelings and other people's feelings and, and, and recognize suffering in ourselves and in others. Um, and when we do that, whole new avenues and horizons of, of lived experience are possible to men that we've been shut off from and we have shut ourselves off from. Um, and with the connection piece, we're, 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 we're calling on men to say, you know what, we, let's acknowledge and, and build on the, the ties we have to each other as human beings, but also to the planet. Uh, to the to the notion that we are you know embodied in bodies and in part of a, a an ecosystem and an environment that we too often have kind of decided we're not part of that you know we're we're just going to control it as opposed to operating within it and being interdependent. Um, so we would like to we're suggesting we move away from the notion that we are independent. We're fiercely you know self made and uh, self sufficient, and rather being interdependent and and relating to others uh, to really kind of build build up on those ties that, that are fully human and then that, uh, that again will allow us to have a fuller experience with our friendships with our relationships and with our world yeah no i, I, I love that um and it it starts to when i started reading all the qualities or the traits that are associated with um liberating masculinity i was like yes these these are the things these are the things that, I, that i've been wanting to do to do more of and in particular for me, it was like reading, I'd had a experience recently where somebody had told me like one of the greatest gifts that I can continue to give is like my love. Like I just have this unending well of love to get, to give to people. And I was like, yes, like this describes it. Like, I just want to go around and give everybody hugs, like tell everybody that I love them. And it felt very freeing to kind of read that, you know, two guys kind of got to this place. I was like, yes, this, how, how do we get more of this into the world? And that's it, and it so, that's such a great thing to hear that you, you're feeling that kind of freedom because we've been told, you know, you're not supposed to be uh, lovey, you know, as a guy. That's that's the feminine, and it's you know, it borders on homosexual. You know, it's, we we are often at least I grew up at a time where that was taboo and mocked uh, homosexuality, and so I think we you know in the in the last several decades, we're realizing that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, why are we judgmental and, and, and ruin it, ru ruling out this whole sphere of life and, and these, the experience of many people that that's core to their identity. Uh, and, and I think the liberating masculinity at its best does free men to love, to, to, to use your, your, your phrase. And so uh, I love that you're, you're, you're seeing that connection there and, and uh, hats off to you for, for loving out loud, Adam. Well, I'll go a step further. So I've, I've, I've been running a, an experiment, if you will, with my close guy friends. And, you know, if, if I'm talking to my mom on the phone or my dad or my brother, like we always end saying, I love you. I tell my wife that I love her every single day. But like, I also have love for many of my friends. And so I've been experimenting with like when, yeah, when we sign off on conversations, I'll tell them that I love them. You know, just like I would, I was talking to a close family member or my wife um, about, anything. And, and it's been really fun to see what those reactions have been. And the, the, my favorite part, I think so far is when it almost feels like, and I, sometimes I can't see their face cause it's just on the phone, but it almost feels like they don't even think about it. It just comes out, you know, I'll be like, all right, man, love you. Talk to you later. And they'll be like, love you too. And then there's almost like this kind of pause before they hang up. Like, Oh my God, did I just say that out loud? Yeah. 
it, and that's kind of what I'm trying to elicit is like, is there, is there any consciousness to, oh yeah, this is a deeper relationship and I'm comfortable saying like, I love you, man. I, that's great. And there's, it's happening in the culture. You're part of something bigger, I think too, Adam, like you see in the sports world, you know, there's more and more like, let's hug it out. You know, uh, love you, man. Uh, Tom Brady, I think said that to all these people after the Super Bowl, you know, a couple of years ago and from the Patriots. Um, and there's a neat part of uh, an anecdote that we capture in the book where Ed Adams, my co-author's men's support group, basically men mentoring men, got to this point where they started telling each other that they loved him, loved each other. Uh, and there's, it was a very kind of awkward moment, like you're describing at first, where this one guy had been really supported by the, these other men who were uh, helping him work through a problem. Uh, and he said, I, I <laughs> like, it's like, and someone else said, do you love us? And he's like, yeah, I do. And, and they're like, love you too. You know, but it was like, there is this barrier to, to overcome that. Why, you know, this is a time to do it, you know? And I think, uh, it, it's, it just frees us to have that deeper relationship as you, as you put it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start, uh, switching gears and get into work in particular, because I know that's what we're, we're here to talk about today. And to get us started, you tell a story in the book about Travis, you know, this young, ambitious manager. And the quote that I pulled out, you say, he managed people using a method that roughly fit into his version of masculinity an autocratic controlling callous style. You know, he had this me first perspective, goal fixation, top down model of leadership, and his upward trajectory hit this hard ceiling. And he, he was really feeling it. He talks about that, you know, sort of in, in the book. And I just, I saw myself in Travis. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, early twenties at this startup, get put in charge of managing a bunch of kids just out of college. Like they're not that much younger than me. And that was what I went to was like, okay, well, I have to show them that like, I'm the boss. I know everything that I'm doing. Um, you know, just follow my plan. Cause it's, it's the right plan. And you basically shut up, put your head down and get your work done. And if it's not working, it's your fault. It's not mine. And like, it didn't go well. And it resulted in them not liking me. It resulted in me burning myself out. And it was just, it was one of the worst and best experiences of my life. Mm. Best in that, like I learned so much from it um, in hindsight. And it really opened me up to see what I didn't want to be as a, as a leader. So talk, I mean, what, let's talk about kind of Travis and how, why do we start there as men? Because that's how we're, how we're taught to show up. Your uh, your experience, what you chose is is just makes so much sense, Adam, and and it did for Travis too. Like that's that's the model of of our dads, you know, the, of the leaders we saw out there, like the decisive, firm, iron fisted uh, man, you know, who's going to be the the conqueror of, of teams and and the and the boss who's going to give directions, and we just now know that that's not working in the work world that's emerging, uh, where that autocratic barking boss uh like you i think you said um callous oh, yeah, we, we used the word callous and you're saying i'm just gonna make them do it without much regard for their feelings or you know what they're experiencing that's just in increasingly ineffective yeah and i mean what i felt in those moments was it didn't feel true for me but it felt like it was the it was the right thing to do in that in that moment it was like well this doesn't feel right but this is what it's it's I think I'm supposed to do it this way, but then I would, I would go home and, you know, this is a big piece that ultimately led to this period of my life where I, you know, dealt with depression and anxiety was this, you know, internal conflict and tension that I had because I'd act that way. And then I'd be like, no, I don't, that's not what mm -hmm. I want, but I feel like I, ha I have to. Um, and yeah, that was a, uh, it was, it was challenging. So it was kind of fun, but also a little bit painful to see myself and Travis and be like, oh yeah, wow. I bet, I bet there's a lot of other guys that go through this too. Yeah. And I, Travis had that same kind of nagging problem with it. Like he, he wanted to be supportive for his team, but his model of leadership w was what exactly you described too. Like I'm going to ride them, you know, and, and actually micromanage them in his case. Like, let me see what you're doing. And I'm going to be the one who says how it's done, not just where we're going. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I've seen with my co-author Ed's uh, men's group and other folks is that it's, men who, who follow those rules are ultimately pretty dissatisfied by the time they're in their fifties and sixties that it's like, what is this all meant? Like I, I haven't been a full 
my my best self or my I, I have been like a robot in some ways or kind of a, a military general but you know where's the love you know and uh, within my um, for my people that i've worked with or even maybe me, my family and others that i've kind of disregarded because i spend so much time just on this work identity or work persona this mask that we we'd put on yes for sure how do, how do we short circuit that how do we make it so that people don't have to wait to their 50s and 60s men don't have to wait that long to wake up to it well we we think that one path is this five c's model uh that we talk about in our book uh and you we've mentioned two of them so far um the curiosity well we've mentioned compassion and connection but we start off with curiosity courage compassion connection and commitment and these are practices that are, you know, on, the, on the one hand, they're age old, uh, and yet they also need an upgrade or, or we kind of offer some new definitions for what, for how men can see them in, in the current moment in the 21st century. But if people follow those in, in the work world and beyond, you know, you can make progress. And we've, we've seen it. We, Ed, Ed Adams' folks have seen it. We've seen, I've seen examples in the business world where men who are showing up in these ways are, are, are increasingly successful. So we talk about the liberating power. It's not just that you're feeling free. You've got more power in the world. You know, even in traditional worlds, like you're able to advance in organizations or, or accomplish great goals because you're working with people that are drawn to you uh, and that are effective on teams. It, it's all good <laughs> when you start practicing these things. Yeah, no, I, I love that. One thing that you, you write in the book is soft skills are success skills. And it's been a topic that I've, I've been having more and more lately is how do we start teaching people uh, these soft skills or, or even at the beginning, just identifying that they have them inside of them and we just need to start flexing those muscles a little bit more. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, one simple way that we can uh, start practicing and developing those soft skills is doing check-ins. You know, in, in in the business context, in meetings, uh, asking people how are you doing, and 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 not just it being a, a superficial question, but maybe asking a, 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 a probing question or really t offering, if you're the leader of that team, offering a bit more vulnerability than maybe you did in the past. So it's not just I'm I'm fine. <laughs> it's like actually I'm I'm pretty torn torn up about the the way the 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 political chaos of the last couple of days say, or I. You know, my brother-in-law is 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 sick with a stroke, and I'm worried for him. Uh, and so, you, this is this part. It's weighing on my mind and my heart today. Uh, these are the things that we know. You know, is, I imagine you've been seeing this too. Is like this is what builds psychological safety in teams. And we now know from the research of like Amy Edmondson of Harvard from Google's research, that's the most important thing for team success. Uh, it's not how smart the people are on the team, what their IQs are. It's not what degrees they have. It's whether they can feel safe to bring their whole selves to the team, not be mocked and have a sense of, I can actually share who I am and, and, and be fully myself on this team. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that's it is we've, we've gone through, I don't know, m most of history is what it feels like, at least, you know, what I've looked at it um, is you, people talk about work-life balance as if you go to, you go to work for this period of time. And then like you're, there's a different self that's outside of work. There's like a work self. And then, so we keep trying to find this like work-life balance, assuming that we're, we're this way at work and then we're a different way at home. But what, what I'm hearing and what I've experienced too, is that you know, it's, it's all one self. And if you're trying to do this flipping back and forth and being different selves throughout the day, well, you're just going to end up being exhausted, you know? Yeah. Exhausted and ultimately less effective. You know, uh, not as satisfied, and and ultimately we're seeing like it's, it's you know the, some of the work of Brene Brown and others have shown like when you're vulnerable, you have more power. You know, you're actually drawing people to you because they're moved. But when you when you're uh, you know opening up the the your defenses or dropping your defenses, letting people see what you're really experiencing, um, and you know you can go too far in that direction. You can be a puddle of tears all the time, and that, but that's we're kind of far away from that extreme at the moment, where we actually need to do more of the like, yeah, this is how how I am right now, and, and I'm I'm not I don't know all the answers, as you put it. Like you know, you were saying you had to know all the answers when if when you admit you don't, and you in, invite people to help you if you're say leading a team, that tends to bring out the best in people. They we are we are drawn to help each other, and we're uh, drawn to want to have a say in things. 
So that's another piece of the puzzle here for, for why this kind of new, this liberating masculinity is powerful uh, and needed is that so much of the old masculinity was about dictatorship, essentially, at work. Like, I'm going to tell you what to do and, and how you're going to do it and where we're going to go. You don't have a say. You're, you're, a, you're a cog in this machine, a foot soldier. It's, that doesn't work in, in, the, in the, you know, we, we talk about the work world getting faster, flatter, and more fairness focused. And if you don't give, vo give options for people to have a say, you're going to be too slow. You, you're not going to, you can't compete. If you're a top-down bureaucratic organization where you're bundling information to the top, they make decisions and then send out the directions. No, you need everybody to be sensing and responding to super fast moving developments. Uh, and that's, that's relates to this idea of a flatter work world and flatter organizations where you've got ad hoc teams. We know that psychological safety matters to bring out the best in all those teams. Again, people want to have a say in those teams. And finally, this fairness piece in the wake of me too, and black lives matter, you've got to be mindful of how other folks have not had a fair shake really at work. Uh, and the need to kind of be an ally to create more fairness, be compassionate for those folks uh, who have had a harder, you know, road road a hole, uh, and really show up as 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 someone who's seeking to, to help the success of others, even as you succeed. Yeah, I mean, what are do you have any good tips on ways that we can be more aware of the things that we're probably just on autopilot most days at work? You know, like how can we raise our that, that our self awareness of not only for ourselves, ourselves, but our teams and the people around us. Great. It's a great question. Um, I do think I like what you said about start with ourselves, uh, because I think the first piece is to, is developing a bit more of an emotional intelligence about what we are ourselves experiencing and some of the ways we get triggered or we, we find ourselves going into old habits. Uh, and, and then it conclude, especially like a meditative practice practice, um, journaling or, or being mindful of what we're experiencing emotionally. We, we just been told to ignore that as men and that's not effective anymore. And, and we need that awareness also then to start being mindful of our, the, of our privilege and the power we've experienced and, and enjoyed or uh, benefited from just by virtue of being men, often white men, often straight white men, my, in my case. Um, and then I think there's a lot about listening uh, at, asking that question, how are you doing? What, tell me about your story. You know, what are your joys and your challenges? And, and, and also reading, you know, doing your homework to kind of learn about the experience of others. Uh, that's been a big part of, of this, this, this re racial reckoning is, is reading books like, uh, you know, Ibram Kendi's books, uh, reading books like black fatigue, um, understanding, you know, the, the, you know, and I did that myself. I read a part of a, a begun this book called Black Fatigue about a black woman who was at Xerox uh, in Rochester, New York, not far from where I grew up. And I was like, oh my gosh, I keep being like shocked by what she, what she experienced. And it's that sense of learning about other people that I think can help us develop that self-awareness uh, that really allows us to show up and, and, and build really inclusive workplaces where everybody can thrive. Yeah, I, I love that. It, it reminded me of a couple things. One, I started thinking about one-on-ones that I've had with people. And just in the last couple of weeks, I've, as part of another project, I've been interviewing uh, sales leaders and sales team members and one-on-ones keep coming up. And so most of the time people describe their one-on-ones as like, it's a task check-in, you know, what's the status of this deal? What got done here? What's up next? Move on. Every now and again, people will say like, yeah, and then, you know, every third one-on-one -on -one, or, you know, every now and again, like we'll talk about how, how I'm really doing and my performance, but I've yet to hear somebody say that they spend time in their one-on-one -on -one checking in on how they're doing as just people and humans and employees. And it feels like that alone by itself is creating the space to, you know, whether it's starting the meeting or at some point in time, when you ask, how are you? It's like a double, how are you, right? That the first, yes, how are you, gets nice. to say, um, oh, I'm pretty good. Things are going good. You know, like you did. And then there's the like, great, how are you really? And it's like, well, you know, my mom just got COVID last week and I'm really frustrated about what's hap what happened at the Capitol yesterday. And I kind of don't know what to do about, you know, this other part of my life. It's like, okay, well, let, let's talk about that because that's probably going to have more of an impact on this to-do list that I can see in whatever tool we're using than anything else. I think that's so true, Adam. Uh, and it, I can speak from experience about 
the value of those double check-ins, as you put it, uh, they're, they're the genuine check-ins. We just have been doing that a great place to work. You know, I'm saying we, I was we until last month, <clears throat> uh, but over the last year, uh, and, and a lot of that was led by one of the men we, I, we profile in the book, Tony Bond, who's our uh, chief innovation officer, chief diversity officer, uh, where we just made space for people to talk about what they're, what they're experiencing and what they're going through. And I think that elevated everybody's sense of, of, of community, of mutual purpose, of mutual aid. Um, Cause there's a wide range of difference, even though how, even though we're all in the pandemic, everybody is experiencing differently from those who have got young children to work, to manage and, and handle all that stress to others that are just isolated or living by themselves. Still others, like you mentioned, may have parents with, with COVID or they may, they, some of them, People, there was at least one staff member who had COVID and talked about it in very personal, poignant terms. So that did not distract us from the business work we did. You know, Great Place to Work had an amazing year financially, I think, because we were all revved up, thanks partly to this full, emotionally intelligent, emotionally uh, available way uh, of being with each other. Yeah. And that that's needed. That's why I meant liberating masculinity has to be there because it, it, you know, our leaders would not have been able to pull this off or make space for this if they were finding, following those old rules of like, that's emotional, soft stuff, doesn't belong in the workplace. No, they invited it in and they showed it themselves. So yeah, that's, that's, vital. that's really special. And it, it makes me think back to an organization that I was a part of when things weren't going well and the, the kind of messaging and the leadership team was, we don't have time for feelings. We just need people to, you know, focus on what needs to get done and go and execute. Like feel, feelings, culture, all that stuff. We'll figure that out when things are going well. But otherwise, like we just don't have time for that. And then you had the staff who was like, can we please talk about this stuff? Because like we are not OK. And like, yeah, you keep showing us these PowerPoint slides of what we need to go and do. But hey, guess what? They're not happening because, hey, we're not OK. So mm. for, if you're an employee and maybe you're not you don't have that level of influence inside your organization, but you see the need for this type of liberation to occur, whether it's um, mas masculine or not, how, how can you r raise that up and, and elevate it? That's a, that's a hard thing when you're not in power uh, to, to do Adam. And I think, you know, one thing you can do is practice it yourself. You know, you always have, there's like the Victor Frankl thing. We, we can bring our, our, we choose the attitude we bring to any situation. So you can say, well, I'm going to do my own personal check-ins. I'm going to keep track of my own, uh, how, how okay or not okay I am. And, and, and I'm all, and then the other thing you can do is look for compatriots in that. Are, is there one manager or one, are there some colleagues that, that share your interest in, in, in being real, you know, about what's going on? And if, if you you also might want to start looking at LinkedIn and job boards. Like, you know, find, there are more and more places now that is part of the culture. And you can just go to Great Place to Work's list of certified great workplaces to find that. There's also like, you know, ratings on Glassdoor that give you a fuzzy truth of what's going on. We don't have to be stuck at crappy workplaces anymore, working for bosses that are, that are uh, you know, stuck in that confined masculinity model of leadership. Well, that... What you just said, that is going to be one of the quote cards that we use to promote this episode. So like, you don't have to be stuck in a crappy place to work, everybody. Like there are better options out there. I think that that's, that's great. So the, the next thing that I'd love to, to jump into is this concept of the for all leader. Can you tell us, tell us what that means and what that entails? Sure. The for all leader is, is the leadership uh, pinnacle that we discovered a great place to work. Uh, we studied 10,000 managers, uh, 75,000 employees, looking at survey comments that we gather. And we, we found that the, the leaders that were the most inclusive, that had no, more than 90% of their people had a consistently great experience, these were the leaders that were also the most effective. They had the highest markers of productivity, adaptability, um, and retention uh, on, on their teams. And they had certain traits that stood out. Among them was uh, a sense of purpose, you know, long-term purpose and, and the sort of highest calling of the organization and their teams. Uh, they also had a sense of humility. They weren't that sort of know-it-all boss that, that you described having a feeling like you had to do when you started off or Travis kind of had that view too. Uh, they also are very focused on building bonds of trust within their teams and then outside of their teams. 
to help other people thrive, help their people thrive. And so these are basically, it's, it's, it's dovetailing with the research on psychological safety. It's dovetailing what we, uh, with what we say about liberating masculinity, uh, that this is not about being the know-it-all boss, the, the one that's emotionally uh, unintelligent, unavailable, but rather uh, the boss that's a good listener, that's, a, that's able to, to sort of appreciate people of different backgrounds and, and make them feel a sense of belonging on their teams uh, to get to that 90 plus uh, percentage level of, of, of inclusion. Um, and essentially these, these are folks that are showing up, uh, as a liberating, if they are men, they're showing up with a liberating masculinity, you know, and if they're women, they're also, you know, adopting similar behaviors, but we, you know, this is the liberating masculinity model is, is something that can be applied to, to all genders. You know, we, just like men can, we actually are saying this is in some ways a mat, a marrying of some traditionally masculine qualities and traditional feminine qualities. We just all got to be human now. And those for all leaders showed that really in the, in the research. Yeah, it, it's. It, I really, I really enjoyed reading that section just to see that that was being. There was some data behind it, in terms of you know it, it being welcomed, it being successful, and then I think that you also you said something about more and more companies are seeking these vulnerable, empathetic, listening skills in leaders, and I'd be curious, what have you heard about how, how are people filtering for that in the? Obviously, you can't pick that up on a resume unless I put it on my resume, which is an interesting thing to think about. You know, but like, yeah. how, how are people filtering for that when they're hiring for these important leadership roles? The, some of them are putting it on the, the job description. Uh, I just, we just, I just interviewed some folks um, uh, at a company that that talk about humble confidence. I think that's the phrase they use uh, for how they're going to be um, seeking their, their people out. Uh, and I also think. It's it's about showing it at the at the leadership level. Like I, you know, a couple of examples I've seen over the past year were were leaders of major companies were super inspiring, and and one of them is Tim Ryan, who's the uh, top executive of of PwC, the professional services and accounting giant. Tim Ryan is this kind of masculinity, as I see it. Uh, he he's been he's been reflecting on questions of of, of racial equity over the last five years or so since he, he joined PwC as its top leader, or he, he elevated to that point, uh, and it initiated conversations about race in which he learned, for example, that his black employees always made sure they carried their business cards when they were driving. Because if they got pulled over as driving while black is the phrase, like they could prove that they could afford this car. You know, and, and, and other similar uh, stories emer emerged about, wow, your life is very different from, from mine. And this is how we need to now take our experiences and, and really try to create a truly uh, inclusive culture at PwC, uh, acknowledging how different people are experiencing the world. Um, so he also uh, was willing to share on a, on a webinar with, with us that his family was experiencing mental health challenge. Uh, and he's also now taking this question about racial equity to a public policy level. He started an organization several years ago about called CEO action for, for diversity and inclusion. Now he's got one, he's a, an offshoot where he's sending several, a, a number of PwC, you know, smart people to work on public policy for racial equity in the United States. Uh, so when you think about that's listening, the issue, issue of, of taking purpose to, to heart, he wants to build a, tr a more trusting society, which requires fairness. Uh, and then being vulnerable about saying, you know, Mental health, which has been stigmatized, this is touching my family. Uh, so I think when people show up that way is in leadership roles, that makes it okay for the entire organization to, to live that that way and operate at all the levels. Uh, and that's going to attract people that that want that want to bring their full selves to work. Yeah, I mean, it it really do, as much as I want to not believe that it all starts at the tops. Some of these things really have to start at the top and. And I, I've been thinking a lot about how if you even if you had a whole organization, like all the employees are totally bought into this way of thinking, this way of behaving and they're doing it. But top level management isn't having it like it's there, there's not that sort of rise up scenario doesn't happen in that case. And we really need uh, more people like him to to your, to your point, to show that to be vulnerable to show what's possible, to ask those questions, to put that stuff out in the open, to create that psychological safety for others to also step into it. I agree. Uh, and I also will say that 
there's a new kind of organizational model that's that's surfacing uh, that I mentioned in the book. It's called a teal organization, and, and that's really kind of the alternative to that top-down leadership model. Uh, and and we've all the teal world is basically it's defined by three breakthroughs. You could say uh, more self-management, so more democratic distributed leadership, distributed power. Holism, where you can bring your full self to work and you, you see the organization is connected to the world and the environment, not, not the sort of walled off, just think about the profits and not worry about anything else. And lastly, uh, it's, it's a, driven by an evolving sense of purpose uh, so that it's not only you know, putting purpose above profits, but it's also constantly I, reflecting on what is it called to do as an organization. So the people are doing that and the whole organization is, is attuned to how they need to show up in the world. And those organizations can't really emerge if the top leader isn't willing to share power, really em embrace all those ideas. But when you do have, you know, a, you know, a leadership that is doing that, then you have a great sense of partnership throughout the whole organization. And the, and the leaders often, they're not a traditional, you know, executive making critical decisions, but rather supporting being a servant almost to everybody else in the organization. And, and some of these places like the Burt's org, um, uh, home health organization in the Netherlands, uh, the the Morningstar tomato processing plant in in California. These are or examples of teal organizations that are just dramatically productive and effective. So uh, there are alternatives to that top down model, but even you know it requires people that are that are starting them that are kind of nominal leaders to embrace that sense of we are going to be more partners than uh, a, a paternalistic leader and peons <laughs> below them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where did, wh why teal? Wh why is that the, the term? Good question. Teal is, I should have said this before, it's, it's part of a color scheme that maps onto levels of human consciousness. And this can, this can sound a little esoteric, but basically it, there's some developmental, uh, human development thinkers that have come up with a, a scheme of colors that go from like red to orange to green to teal. And they're, they're they map onto organizations that say, uh, have different levels of, of awareness and consciousness. So at the, that orange level is maybe the typical capitalist um, organization that's driven by achievement and about uh, profits. It doesn't pay that much attention to the impact on the world or to kind of including other voices. Uh, the green one is it kind of maps out of the diversity and inclusion push these days where, okay, everyone's going to have a say, uh, get, get included. Uh, uh, the teal one is a step higher than that. We would say because it it actually does distribute power. It's not just having everyone gets to say something, but you're going to be giving power out and letting people with authority, expertise, kind of move move forward. And it's also it's got this sense of of my of deep purpose. It's not going to be let's worry about you know getting to certain revenue goals. It's more like we are about achieving something in, that serves the world. Yeah. So that's where the teal stuff comes in. I promise I did not choose teal because we were talking today. This is just uh, yeah, you got your dark teal there. I love it. <laughs> I know. As soon as you said teal and I, and I read in the book, I was like, oh, well, this will be this will be per perfect timing. I don't have to ask Ed what color he wants on in the background. I've already got it on. <laughs> right on. And you notice our book cover has got that that uh, that color scheme as well. I had, my my co-author was willing to let me uh, have that piece, uh, which I think is a good looking color too. Oh, yeah, so I've, I've got it in the <laughs> in the mandate colors as well. Yeah. So one of the other areas that I wanted to get into was uh, you talk about or you tell the story in the book about Paul and his calling to be a nurse and how you, you hit on the, the big trend right now, which is job displacement and how a lot of the new jobs that are replacing factory jobs and their blue collar positions are in helping professions that are historically associated with women. Um, and like we're seeing tremendous amounts of job growth there, but there's this sort of resistance to like, well, that's not. That's not for, for me. And then you've got this great story to go with it about Paul uh, finding out that like he thinks that he should go be a nurse and he does it and he loves it. And he's living this like more fulfilled life that he's ever had before. Talk, talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, yeah. I love that story as well, Adam. And, and it, to your point, he not only kind of had heard this calling within him to be a caregiver, a nurse, um, that he eventually found he could pursue. I think it was because of the men mentoring men group that that get if gave him that courage to to leave a different different line of work, um, but then he started he thr he thrived when he was there. You know this is he was, you know thinking about new ways to make his emergency room uh, better. You know and one thing he brought to it was a greater sense of um, compassion 
and, and kindness because there had been sort of a dark humor within the, the, the emergency room setting. Uh, he, he noticed some EMTs that were, they were just sort of callous about gunshots, say, or other kind of mishaps, uh, you know, the injuries they were, they were, that we're experiencing and, and, and bringing people to the hospital with. And, you know, it's a, it was a defense mechanism. And, and Paul kind of called attention to this and said, let's, let's treat people with greater dignity and, and kindness in this setting. And, you know, that, that elevated the place. And, and he's found himself rising in the organization, getting greater responsibilities, leadership roles, because I think he's been able to, to pursue his calling. I love that. There's something I hadn't, really thought about calling until I started working with the coach that I work with right now. And he was kind of like, yeah, this, you know, there's purpose and that can kind of send you down the, the wrong path. And, uh, you know, what am I supposed to be when I grow up? But I really, really gravitated towards this idea of like my calling from the standpoint of like, there's some, some voice somewhere that's saying like Adam or Ed or Paul, like you got to come and do this thing. Like this thing is for you. And then when you get in that zone, you're, you're kind of unstoppable because it's, it's yeah. bringing out all the best parts of you that bring you energy that don't suck energy from you. At least that's the way that I've kind of thought about it. I, I think you named it really well there. Uh, and I think that goes back to this idea of, of how the confined masculinity keeps us from hearing that calling. Uh, we are, we kind of are, we think of intuition as like a female intuition, right? We, we, we block off this notion that we might be, uh, that our soul may be drawn to something. You know, and and that we uh, we that's a, it, it taps into this notion of spirit, which we also kind of like write off as woo woo, or we tend to, or maybe we have a very strict sense of religiosity that is about following the teachings of a particular practice. But it, more and more, I think that there is an a, an openness and a realization that um, when we listen to those callings, to our intuition, when we are available to to where we're drawn, as you said, Adam, the 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 excitement, the enthusiasm is hard to turn off and, and you can get through a lot of challenge when, when you're really attuned to, to where you, your spirit is, wants to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love thinking about that, that alignment. And, and once again, it, you have to open up, you've got to kind of take, take off these constraints to be able to see those possibilities, to hear the voice, whatever, you know, you want to make it, uh, make the analogy to, to, to see those opportunities. Are there any, have you found anything that works for you to, to open up to more of those possibilities? And I, and what comes to mind for me is I've wanted to do, I love singing. Right. Hmm. But I've always been like, eh. if I told my guy friends that I wanted to go take singing lessons, they'd be like, what the hell's the matter with you? Like, come on, dude. Um, yeah. That's one of the goals this year now. It's like, I want to go take singing lessons. And I, and I wouldn't have been open to that before. So what, what have you found that helps you open up to more of these uh, liberating things? Great question. Journaling is, is big for me. I'm like, got my little notebook here that I'm constantly trying to do a reflection a day, if not more than that. Um, I would say that uh, prayer, you know, I, I have a little ritual with some, my wife and some friends who are every morning, we, we say the serenity prayer and, and kind of hear what's on each other's hearts. Um, and, and, and that goes in, I also attend a Presbyterian church, uh, here in San Francisco. I'm one of the rare churched people of San Francisco. Um, and, uh, I would say another thing, um, is being in community around it. Like, you know, that prayer porch, we call it a prayer porch. It, it comes out of a, a beautiful ritual that my aunt and uncle started, um, when their son died in a tragic accident and people just started praying on their porch every day in Chicago. And so we, we've borrowed that tradition. Um, and this, the notion that your soul will speak more bravely when it's surrounded by loving, caring people is powerful. And Parker Palmer, the author talks about this and I, I have found it to be true as well. So those are some practices you know, make, make time to be quiet and listen and, and reflect, but also find a, a circle of, of friends and loved ones that, uh, can help you hear, hear your calling. Wow. That is, I've, that's really powerful. I've got, I've got a lot to think about on that one for sure. And there's a, there's a really good quote in there that I'm going to make sure to go and to go and write down from oh, it too. Thank you. Um, yeah, th there is, that is another one of those powers of connection that I feel like nice. it's, we can, we can gloss over sometimes, you know, is that there's the connection of like, Hey, we're hanging out, we're connected. Cool. That's great. But that next level of connection that is that helps you hear that calling, that helps you 
see these possibilities, whatever your, your sensory input is that you want to go with, um, finding that right group and whether it's men or women or, you know, mix, whatever, whatever it is for young, old, um, it's, it's about those people that can help you hear and see the, the goodness and the greatness and the amazing things that are, that are all inside of us. Totally. Uh, and I, I wonder if I can share one other example to kind of make this clear that it's not going to cost you your career <laughs> necessarily to kind of ex explore these things. Can I share one, one other example? Yes, please. Um, and this doesn't exactly follow the, the, that community thing we were just talking about, but in a way it does. It, I, I was going to share the, the example of Chuck Robbins, the CEO of Cisco. Um, and when he took uh, over as CEO of Cisco some years ago, it, it, the, the technology giant based in San, San Jose, California, um, he uh, soon into his, his, his leadership there, he had a dream, a dream of, of ten, uh, visiting a homeless encampment in San Jose, which is in the Silicon Valley area, the Bay Area. And he saw in the dream the face of his pastor and his father. And rather than, you know, just, oh, that was a bad dream. You know, the next day he woke up and said, I need to do something about this. He, he, he was actually listening to that intuition, that calling, if you will, and said, I, I'm going to, he called the mayor of San Jose the next day and said, I, I want to help. And then he started sharing his desire to help with his organization, with Cisco. Not only did they devote tens of millions of dollars to, to programs and, and facilities to help with homelessness, but he kind of inspired a company-wide elevation of philanthropy. And then also dovetailed with higher business performance, you know, because everyone's now prouder to be at Cisco, to be part of a company that is making it, the world better. So it's not just us, you know, you and me and, and others, maybe kind of mid-career or, or average, you know, average Joes, but leaders of the, the top organizations of the world are embracing this. And, and they're setting a great example to follow. All of us can do this. And it's actually, it's more of what's going to help you succeed now than what's going to hold you back. Yeah, it's, it's great. And the more examples like that, that we can have, I think the, the better, that's what, that's what I keep thinking about is the, this public vulnerability to be able yes. to first just share and be open about what you're feeling, what you're thinking. That's great. And then when you've got people that are willing to, to match that with action at that level, like C Cisco, those stakes are high. Yeah. Right? Like they've got, they have stakeholders and they probably think about stakeholders and, you know, very, very deep and, uh, and, and wonderful way. But like, if, if he can do it, we can, we can all do it at our, exactly. and, and not, you know, to say the word, you know, varying levels or whatever, all of our lives are important, but we like, mm -hmm. okay, well, Chuck can do it. I can do a little bit more of that in my life too. Exactly. Yeah. I don't mean to say he's better than anybody else. He would be the first to say he's not, you know, just sure. pointing out that like, if, if we look at those traditional paths of, of authority and prestige, the, the folks that some of the best, uh, company leaders are doing this kind of work. And it, I, I see it as an inspiration for the rest of us. It, it's the dream thing. One, I love it because he's willing to say like, Oh, I had this dream and talk about it publicly. My wife and I talk about our dreams every single morning, but it actually got, I got in the habit of doing that uh, at the, the last place that I worked at is, you know, with my team is we're just that comfortable. I tell them, Oh, I had this dream and it, you know, kind of inspired me about this thing or, they okay. probably got sick of me talking about my, you know, my shower thoughts, but that tends to be, you know, my morning mm -hmm. ritual is like, I wake up, I shower, which means I've got like all these cleansing shower thoughts. And then I go and I journal and that's where I can kind of like have all mm -hmm. this stuff come out. And that is my journal is my safe space to just put those, what might feel like crazy ideas, but then they keep showing up. It's like, well, I can't, I can't ignore this. Like something is telling me that I need to pay attention to this a little bit more. Yeah. Like starting a podcast on, on men, men's emotional vulnerability like that was yeah. probably in there somewhere like it's that is absurd several years ago and now you're doing it so hats yeah, off that, for your, your your work that was in there and i'll, I'll have a i'll have a guest on here uh, i think i think she's coming on next week and i've been writing about this hadn't talked to her in six months and i talked to her like hey let's catch up and we're talking and i'm telling her kind of about what i'm up to hadn't mentioned men's stuff at all and she's like i've got an idea for you i think that you should get into this like men's mental health space. And I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. And so of course I tell her all my ideas and she's like, yeah, well, that's how, that sounds about right. It was just crazy to hear somebody that was in my life that I was connected with that had, you know, it's, it's going to deliver this message to me from somewhere else too. That's another way that connection piece works. I think Adam, like you're saying, like sometimes the people around us see our strengths or our, our inclinations in ways we can't, or we, sh we shut ourselves off from doing. Even when I, 
left Great Place to Work, for example, there was a really beautiful ceremony kind of sending me away a surprise going away party, you might say. And like 15 people gave these testimonials of ways I uh, touched them or the organization over the past seven years. And that was, it just filled my sails and made me re realize ways I had, I can do things in ways I didn't realize and I want to keep doing, you know, so I'm making a positive impact on others. I mean, they didn't, they could have probably talked a lot about the problems, you know, how it was a pain in the butt um, and they withheld that, but just knowing the positive stuff, uh, I, you know, I saw new things. So it, I, I love hearing your story about your, your friends saying you should do this stuff and you're, it was already kind of bubbling up on you. Yeah. And I think that it's also, obviously it's easy, easier, I think when people are sharing positive things with you, but you also remained open to what, what they were saying. And you actually heard it, which goes back to earlier when you were talking about listening and how important that is. Because it, mm -hmm. it could have been too easy to just be like, yes, I am awesome. Thank you for letting me know, you know, once again, or, you know, the, the other end of that spectrum, which is like, oh, no, no, like you're just too humble, right? Which means you're not willing to hear it because you're overconfident or you're yeah. underconfident with what's going on. It's finding that right balance to be able to hear the goodness in there. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and one thing in particular that I have taken away from these, you know, recent feedback points is being energetic. You know, the, in, a, in a way, it's the cool guy is the right guy in the past, right? The, the guy that was a little standoffish, you know, you're, you're kind of um, aloof, you know, you're, you're distant and, and you're that self-made man at island. And, and what I realized, I know I want to be, my exuberance is, is a positive thing. You know, I mean, it's not that traditional masculinity, but it's like people say, I always appreciated you being energetic and, and elevating the, 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 you know, the, the, the fun. And, and that is something I want to take forward now that I heard to your point. And it, it does require being open and being willing to break out of some of those old masculine rules. Yeah, no, that's, so, that's so cool. Um, what, do you mind sharing? What are some of the other things that you, you heard from people that you started to appreciate in yourself more? Another thing that I'm really proud of that and I was a little bit conscious of, but maybe not as much as I realized, it wasn't as aware, as aware of as I heard in these conversations, was elevating other people around me, uh, especially in some way. It was really meaningful to hear it from some woman of color um, uh, that, that I had, they really appreciated I'd been like this advocate for them. Um, and uh, I want to keep doing that. You know, it, it, it's I'm, I'm I'm more aware of it now than ever in the wake of the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but I've always had that kind of like you can do this too. You know what? You know, get get your your best uh, stuff out there as a writer. Say I often worked. I co-authored a bunch of stuff with some of these other folks, and I, they really appreciated that I looked out for them as, as having a byline in Fortune magazine, say, or in a blog. That's or help them give a speech at at our conference. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's something real special about being able to elevate the people up around you that always feels so good. Well, we are, we are coming up on, on the hour today. So I always love to end these mandates with some final words of wisdom. So for our, our listeners out there who might be watching this later on, I guess, I mean, even today, if, if you're watching this, it is Friday, you got to go back to work. What, what are some words of wisdom you could leave them with about masculinity at the workplace? There's a better way there's a better way than the one we most of us grew up with uh, that, that says we're supposed to be limited in what we can do in life and, and how we can relate to others. Um, and, and the phrase that we came up with in the book that, that I think is, rings true to me is that if you're going to show up in those older ways where we risk showing up as uh, rigid, cold, and isolated in a, in a world that's now calling for flexibility, warmth, and connection. So, move to, in this direction of liberating masculinity, you won't regret it. I love that. Well, Ed, thank you so much for being here today. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation as usual. Um, been a fantastic guest. I'm so very grateful for you. Thanks so much, Adam. I had a great experience as well. All right. We'll talk again soon. All right, everybody, that wraps up today's edition of The Mandate. Thank you so much for tuning in if you were here live, if you're watching this later. I hope you enjoyed it. For sure, uh, if you're on YouTube, leave us a comment down below. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you find out when we go live with more of these. Hopefully in the future, you know, you'll know that you can always ask questions in the chat. I'll get those, get those to our guests every single week when we have time for them. 
um, to drive more, more engagement and make sure that you get out of this as much as you possibly can. So thanks uh, to everybody who tuned in today. Special thanks to our guest, Ed, for uh, joining us as well. I've got his LinkedIn down there. If you have questions for Ed, want to connect, uh, send him a message, tell him you saw him on the mandate and, and want to learn more. And then, of course, got all sorts of goodies over at mandateshow.com for you. We'll put this recording up, the podcast episode, and uh, some more links to stuff that Ed is working on for you to check out. And then we are on Instagram and Twitter. If you want to hang out with us, we are getting that going as well. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, always a pleasure. Have a good one, and we will 